Welcome, everyone, to this year's special urban design evening lecture. It's really a great pleasure tonight to welcome back Roseanne Haggerty, an alumnus of the school who has, over the past two decades, single-handedly changed the landscape of homelessness, of housing, and of real estate by opening up new possibilities for how we think of, approach, and design for our most vulnerable populations. In many ways, Roseanne's work and trajectory represents all that we aspire here to here at GSAP. If we understand this school as one that is committed to exploring and supporting new modes of knowledge, new forms of practice, and especially new ways to engage across all of the disciplines of the built environment, then Roseanne is certainly a one-of-a-kind role model and an inspiration, having demonstrated throughout her practice how to turn our unique skills as synthesizers, whether we are architects, urban designers, or real estate developers, to think across silos, disciplinary, professional, governmental, or institutional, and, quote, connect the dots, as she has often said, to find very precisely where and how to intervene, at what scale, and towards what end. In 1990, Roseanne founded Common Ground in New York, a nonprofit social services organization whose motto was radical, housing first. Soon after, the organization, now known as Breaking Ground, became a pioneer in creating more than 5,000 units of housing for the homeless in the city. In 2011, she launched Community Solutions to address the causes leading to homelessness, working with communities across the country. There are many incredible discoveries that Community Solutions has been able to make throughout the initiatives it has launched over the past years. And so I would like to highlight a few that I believe really speak to how far Roseanne has taken design thinking and design intelligence in terms of expanding what it can do and what we can contribute as architects and practitioners of the built environment. The first is this discovery and understanding that knowing the individual name and stories of each homeless person was essential to fighting the increasing number of homeless people in the country. Without the connection between the individual specific scale of one person and the large scale of housing, the city and its infrastructure, this could not be resolved. The second is how the use of data analytics and data visualization was not only critical to thinking and designing solutions across all of these scales, the individual and the collective, the localized and the national, etc., but that rendering the data visible was also about rendering the stories that it told tangible, that storytelling and humanizing those experiences were essential to mobilizing effort and engagement. And finally for me, Roseanne's practice embodies this critical notion we are trying to grapple with, whether it is designing for climate change with, within global urbanization or to address increasing inequality, is the idea of designing with uncertainty, the openness to continuously learn, to design processes and feedback loops and engage the world not with the assurance of our expertise, but with the confidence that our ability to draw things together, to think across scales and silos, and to render invisible relations visible is a first step towards meaningful action, engagement, and knowledge. Roseanne is a MacArthur Fellow, Ashoka Senior Fellow, and Schwab Foundation Social Entrepreneur. She received the Jane Jacobs Medal for New Ideas and Activism given by the Rockefeller Foundation and was awarded with an honorary doctorate in human letters at Emmanuel University this year, as well as with an independent sector's John W. Gartner Leadership Award. Common Ground, her first nonprofit endeavor, has received the Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence, the Peter Drucker Award for Nonprofit Innovation, and the World Habitat Award through the United Nations and Building and Social Housing Foundation. And tonight we're also delighted that Kate Orff will give the response, another person who has been teaching us how to design with uncertainty. But first, welcome Roseanne. Thank you, Mal, and uh, thank you all for being here. It's uh, a real treat to be back at Columbia, at uh, GSAP. And I uh, uh, am really grateful to have a chance here to sort of explore some, uh, some insights and some discussion topics that have become more and more uh, evident and important to my colleagues and me. And to have a chance to um, socialize some of these insights with you is very helpful to our work at this point. 
So uh, I've titled my remarks tonight, Housing is a Verb, because I think this is you know, what, what we're seeing now in uh, many years of work and now working in many parts of this country and internationally has been in some ways a, a, a missing uh, piece of the way we've thought about housing for vulnerable people and those for whom uh, uh, finding uh, stable um, and, and safe accommodation is, uh, is going to require the actions of others. And uh, I am going to organize my remarks tonight around three questions, three themes, three observations. And uh, one is that uh, in the spirit of housing as a verb, that um, we've learned that housing is a process as well as a product. And how we design the process matters in terms of whether we have communities where everyone has basic accommodation. Second um, is the question, and again, it's uh, very much about action. Uh, who gets to design the housing and the housing process? And then lastly, how we think in terms of designing community housing systems. And that's um, obviously a social activity. So to begin, if, um, if we're all looking for housing, what do we do? Well, that's <laughs> yeah, very familiar. We, we go to Craigslist. Um, this is, this is you know, the, the, the path we typically follow, or we hire a broker. Uh, but what if you don't have the resources to do that? Um, financial? Uh, if um, you're struggling with a disability, if you're dealing with issues of stigma because of um, past history and in institutions of one type or another. And in some ways, the fact that how we get access to housing if we can't manage the process of, of, uh, on our own, it's kind of no one's job to figure that out when you think of it. You know, people who design housing, people who build housing, people who regulate housing, people who finance housing. But whose job is it to put all the pieces together and make sure all of these different investments and, and, and typologies actually align and, and somehow get matched to the population in ways that don't become this uh, cruel game of musical chairs? And um, we had to learn this the hard way because even though we'd spent years um, uh, building uh, supportive housing, and I'll, I'll go into more of that, when we started asking ourselves the question from the point of view of the person experiencing homelessness, what does it look like to actually find a home? We mapped our own process. We kind of called it our housing ecosystem. And you'll see it's, it's a non-ecosystem. It's basically like chutes and ladders. These all represent steps that a person who's homeless would have to go through to get into a stable home. Um, you know, all sorts of documentation that they would not typically have, that none of us would typically have, frankly. You know, original copies of birth certificates and various government forms. Um, there's uh, this long process of uh, demonstrating your uh, eligibility, uh, proving who you are, uh, proving what your disability is, proving... proving that you're actually homeless, proving how, um, that your income, your citizenship, and then it, none of the housing programs, and, and I counted recently in New York, there are 11 different housing production and finance programs at HPD, others at HDC, others still at the State Housing and Community Renewal Agency. Um, there are zoning incentives, tax incentives. Uh, there are four different rent subsidy programs there are all of the housing units that already have been built that are owned and managed by NYCHA. There are all of the buildings that have already been built subject to various uh, uh, regulatory agreements that are on turnover or initial occupancy available to homeless or low-income people. Uh, plus, there are the vast resources now at the Department of Homeless Services, somewhere between $1.6 and $2.3 billion a year being spent on homelessness on responding to it with emergency shelters, uh, plus different rent subsidy programs uh, that, that are attached to incenting landlords to accept people out of homelessness, plus you know, quite substantial numbers of buildings that are being used for temporary shelters. 
So when you think of it, you know, that all of these resources aren't connected, uh, but represent our efforts in New York alone to try to fill housing gaps, um, you know, you'd be, th this, this, you know, kind of picture that was our own reality begins to make more sense and why having a, a mindful design of a housing system, of, of understanding the process of getting someone with low income, with challenging situations into a stable home, you know, is so confounding. Uh, basically, we are living in a world in many places, you know, some, some of it's changing, where there is absolutely no clear path to housing. And how housing is distributed, if you require some type of assistance, is through waiting lists, lotteries, or other type random events that actually defy an intention uh, of getting everyone in one's community a stable place to live. So we thought that maybe this was just New York, but when we started working nationally, uh, we actually, with some designers, uh, took this idea of maybe it's the process of housing that needs to be examined, and maybe it needs to be someone's job in a community to actually rationalize this and, and make it a frictionless for the vulnerable people seeking housing. And this, I think, was from a meeting in Long Beach. And uh, what we did around the country and uh, the communities that we started work with, working with on housing system design is ask everyone who had a piece of the action, whether it's the you know, housing authority, uh, 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 not-for-profit organizations, uh, the, the VA in the case of veterans who are homeless, uh, people from City Hall, to actually you know, sit down and with you know, these, these different um, magnets, uh, imagine what it would take to get a single person out of homelessness. And Typically, I think on average, it took about three hours and 20 minutes for these teams to figure it out because no one had actually the whole picture. They knew what their next step or their agency required. These um, uh, 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 yellow uh, uh, magnets represent moments at which there had to be an exchange of paperwork, of money, and th they were you know, complete log jams. And what we, um, what we added up in various communities was the average length of time even if you could get through this process, that it would, re would be required for a single homeless individual to get housed. And I think it was 245 days. And uh, uh, the, uh, in some communities, much worse. In some communities, they just kind of gave up. They realized it was a path to nowhere. And then we asked those same teams to then, you know, gave them permission to design what a sane process would look like if your intention really was to optimize your housing resources and have a process that worked for everyone. And the teams could do this in about 10 minutes. It just, you know, it's very intuitive, very logical. And it was basically take out a lot of these steps, what's really important to know. And uh, it was sort of like the, 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 the need for some kind of coordination and, and permission to actually solve the problem of optimizing housing. And when we, we pressed groups about why they couldn't do what they just designed, what we heard over and over again in communities throughout the country was uh, they didn't know, but they thought they just needed permission. And so one of the things that I uh, just want to really implant is this idea that you know, the, 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 the design tools that at uh, GSAP you're learning, you know, look beyond the individual buildings. This mess is really what explains a lot of what's going on in homelessness in our country, and especially what you see in New York, that uh, the process itself is at odds with um, a, a result which uh, we, would, we would all hope for for each other, that people who are vulnerable and need the assistance of public uh, uh, subsidies or publicly assisted housing of some sort that, that there's actually a frictionless process. And so once we started understanding that uh, this actually needed to be um, e examined as um, a, 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 a principal tool in the work of ending homelessness, um, it really kind of shifted, frankly, our whole worldview. And, and with that background about I hope I've convinced you that we've got process problems and need accountability and good design to understand how to allocate housing 
and how to make the experience of it saying, well, it, it did kind of um, reframe almost everything we'd worked on to that point. And so I'm going to go back probably about 10 years from, from this moment to when um, I worked on our first uh, big development, which was uh, the renovation of the Times Square Hotel, which is on the corner of 43rd Street and 8th uh, Avenue in Manhattan. And at the time, uh, the, we took over the building and put together a plan to save it and convert it into um, a, a very large 652-unit uh, permanent supportive housing uh, uh, residence. At that time, Times Square itself was a pretty chaotic place. This was in the early 90s, uh, just after I'd uh, uh, left Columbia. And uh, uh, the building had uh, been built in the, the early 1920s at a time when there were many SRO, single room occupancy hotels, built in uh, Manhattan and in downtown Brooklyn in particular. And you'd find them in many, uh, many cities uh, built in that era uh, for single uh, individuals, a lot of returning uh, GIs from the First World War. But as people were flocking to cities, this kind of uh, single room with uh, shared baths, uh, very you know, respectable place to live. Uh, in fact, you'd find these types of dwellings really running the gamut from uh, a, a very primitive like lodging house type arrangement or cubicle hotel on the Bowery up to something that would have been in its prime in, in 1923, considered a very um, uh, uh, reasonable first step in housing if you were moving to Manhattan and working in the theater district or, or you know, as, as uh, some, in some startup profession. Well, by the time we acquired it. It was in bankruptcy. There were about uh, 2,700 building code violations. It was a, you know, kind of almost a, an official disaster. But what we had seen there was the opportunity to really rethink that old form of housing that had really been discarded, the, the SRO. Uh, New York City had, in fact, passed legislation over the years to ban the, the new construction of SROs. It was really kind of written off by quality housing advocates. Uh, but we saw at a time there was rising homelessness in New York that there was a real future in rethinking these buildings and adding what was missing, which is essentially good design, accountable management, and for those who needed support, a, a real firm linkage to the kinds of assistance with health and mental health and employment issues that people would need to get back on their feet. Well, uh, uh, we were fortunate. Um, uh, that a, a whole set of circumstances, in some ways not unlike the, the present moment in New York City and, and homeless uh, issues, uh, the mayor at the time had announced with rising homelessness a plan to open new shelters. Uh, neighborhoods recoiled. And yet in Times Square, uh, we had uh, an interesting set of facts with you know, pretty enlightened business owners and with a, a, an activist community board that was troubled by the fact that these building conditions were so poor and there were still about 200 elderly and mentally ill people s stranded there and that they needed a plan. And so um, proposing to turn this into mixed income housing and to address the quality environment deficits with uh, a complete um, redevelopment of the interior of the building to create um, efficiency apartments and then along with that space for the social services support and to um, allocate about half of the units for lower income working people, so have workforce housing mixed with housing for the formerly homeless. We were able to finance this and uh, uh, you know, in, in some ways it was a simple idea and not surprisingly, it worked. I mean, frankly, there's not a lot that good design and good management kind of accountability doesn't solve. And uh, what, uh, what happened next was surprising. I mean, the, the, the project was very popular. People, frankly, did hold their breath since it was so large. And, you know, there's a sense of, you know, will, will working people be willing to live with people who'd been homeless? And, frankly, good design and good management solves just about everything and good value. Uh, we had uh, uh, affordable rents for everyone. But what was problematic about uh, the Times Square, um, which we thought was a great success for several years, was what it didn't do. Um, and not long after we fully rented up and the building was stabilized and we're breathing a sigh of relief that it worked, 
it dawned on me that I was still walking past the same homeless individuals living on the streets of Times Square or, um, that had been there before the building reopened. And it was the first time that it really dawned on me, like, why, why did I think this was all going to sort of sort itself out without some intentionality? And, um, and it, it goes to, again, this question of system design. Um, we were housers. Other not-for-profits ran the outreach teams, and we didn't talk much. Our tenants who moved into the Times Square were individuals who were referred by New York City shelters. Um, it really was kind of a first-come, first-serve situation. You had your application in, and you, know, you were coming from a shelter, and we had a, a vacant apartment. Um, you were in. And uh, the, um, the fact that there seemed to be no correspondence between our creating all of this housing for homeless individuals and the fact that nothing changed on the streets in Times Square, you know, it, it's funny the stories you begin telling yourself, well, I guess people you know, weren't interested or uh, that uh, uh, maybe it's because we require people to sign leases, you know, and like never actually spoke to anyone who was homeless on the streets of Times Square to find out why didn't you apply to our building until something happened. Um, I got a call from uh, a social worker at Bellevue Hospital who told me she had with her someone who had identified me as her next of kin. And I couldn't imagine who that was. Well, it turned out it was a, an elderly woman we used to see regularly in Times Square and uh, who was always very silent, but you know, always looked so frail that when I'd see her and m most of my colleagues, we all stopped to ask her if we could do anything to help. And uh, well, lo and behold, it was this woman who wanted to move into the Times Square. And it was only then when I turned to my colleagues and said, you know, do we have a, a vacancy? Like, well, we have a waiting list. And you know, is this person clean and sober? You know, uh, does she have insight into men her mental health issues? I'm like, we ask those questions? How is that relevant to someone who we, we actually could, could pretty much tell without you know, being told by a doctor was likely to die on the street? Well, we realized we had to kind of throw out our own playbook about you know, the, the process of connecting someone with housing. And when we moved her in, she told us straight up, that the reason she had never asked for help before or even re re returned our comments was uh, that we had always asked her about, you know, do you need a ride to a shelter? Can we help you with food? We had never offered to assist her in finding a home. And so with that kind of aha, that it was really we had failed to match the resource that we had of this uh, quite abundant housing with the needs of people who were clearly stranded on the street in our own neighborhood, that really was the moment of reversal. And so I guess just to, to you know, pause on, on, on this insight, you know, all of the housing in the world won't solve homelessness if the people who are the most vulnerable, least able to act on their own, if we're not taking responsibility for building a system into which good projects fit that you have to start with the people and then design the projects. And so this notion of housing is a process. You know, uh, we, we learned in a very um, a challenging way. But then we decided we could do something different. And uh, my colleague uh, Nadine Male is here and was part of this project. We, um, we realized we had made this um, uh, you know, kind of blind leap into building housing without really understanding who needed to move into it uh, because we weren't talking to the people who needed to be our co-designers. So we began with um, just hiring some really thoughtful interns and asking them to go interview every single person living on the streets in Times Square and ask them about their housing preferences. And I remember going to meetings with you know, these really fine people at the outreach teams who, who would scoff at the idea. Like, people are service resistant. They're there for a reason. They're not willing to go to shelter. Well, all, I think all but about a dozen people who live between uh, 14th Street and 59th Street, you know, west of 6th Avenue, all but a dozen people uh, were, were you know, prepared to sit down, 
uh, go through you know, a whole interview question uh, or, or, or questionnaire and get, uh, provide very detailed information about their housing needs. And what was really striking about it was how um, reasonable and achievable people's aspirations were. Uh, no one was asking for a rent-stabilized apartment in you know, the best neighborhood in New York. People were saying, if I had a place that was clean, safe, no questions asked, private, social workers, great, but I'd like to be the one to choose when and where to meet with them. And what we also uh, learned that pretty much blew us away was that people were eager to pay for their housing. People typically had between $5 and $15 they were willing to spend, but we heard over and over again that there was nothing in the market that would actually meet their income level. And also their, um, their, their um, other kind of considerations around paying for accommodation. People could pay one night at a time or possibly a week at a time. Uh, they couldn't amass enough money for a, a, a down payment on an apartment or even to you know, enter into a lease. And so it was um, a, a real revelation about uh, market failure, frankly, and that um, really the course of our work has, has been uh, shaped by this idea of who gets to design and, uh, and also who can tell us about the processes that we need to have in place to actually see that uh, we, we have housing uh, available that is designed with, with actual people in mind. Well, we um, uh, uh, began working uh, not just as housing developers, but as, uh, I would say, kind of system engineers uh, uh, at that moment and started uh, uh, building pathways for people uh, leaving the street. And it was uh, interesting to discover that at that time in New York, you actually weren't considered homeless if you lived on the street because you needed the certification of having been in a shelter. So we had to run around getting affidavits from like the coffee guy, you know, that yes, I have seen this individual homeless for a continuous nine months. And to begin to actually piece together uh, a, a documentary record that would qualify individuals to live in uh, the government assisted housing that was being built at that time. But we, what we also uh, began understanding and kind of a key, you know, um, moment was when we hired onto our team to lead this effort, someone who had uh, recently left the military, because we found that it was almost, it was going to require a different type of imagination and a different facility with problem solving and data to begin bending the system in a new way. And um, our colleague, Becky, who's a, uh, an intelligence officer in the military, of course, her first question was like, what's the ground truth? What are we looking at? Who do we know? Where do we find them? Where do we see them? And at that point, um, outreach was a nine to five, Monday through Friday activity. Well, Becky and her small team, got to know everyone by name, realized that, you know, and this was the first uh, huge uh, insight that, again, has, has been transformational, which is that homelessness is just too big a category. You know, there are people experiencing homelessness who've been homeless a day and homeless 30 years. And it's like saying a sickness, as though it's all one thing. You can't begin to respond unless you understand like, the individual situation and the individual diagnosis. And what's so counterintuitive is we began learning that you solve big problems the more granular and personal you make them. Because at that time, there were about 55 people on average who would be homeless in Times Square overnight because our team started working at night. But they found over the course of the first six weeks that only 18 of those individuals were homeless every night. And so we, they could see that there's this differential pattern. And what we began doing is housing those people and figuring out how to get through that shoots and ladders game and get people into housing. And in the course of three years, we'd set a target of reducing homelessness in Times Square by uh, two thirds in three years. We were able to reduce it by 87% by focusing on the right people who needed the housing intervention, and with everyone else, giving them the lighter touch help to connect them with resources so that they could, in many respects, solve their, their, their own situation. Well, this um, idea that we had to move from kind of like the chaos to a streamlined, coordinated system was uh, first uh, effective in Times Square, and we began to get um, inquiries from 
some real early adopter types in cities around the country who were thinking there's got to be a better way that, you know, in any city, cities are spending a fortune managing homelessness when uh, they were looking, you know, there, there's lots of smart people out there saying, there's got to be a better way to invest our resources. And in fact, we were able to, with about nine other cities who are interested in uh, working together in another kind of housing as a verb way, learning our way forward together about what it was going to take to create something that looked like that, a coordinated system. And so after about um, 10 months of realizing that we could accelerate our learning and our ability to place people in housing, the, the more in sync we were in sharing goals and uh, kind of stopping doing things that were you know, kind of traditional but, but not getting us anywhere, we um, uh, launched something that in, you know, was frankly less crazy than it sounds. Uh, uh, we had started by then uh, spending a lot of time with people in, uh, in systems engineering, quality improvement, data analytics, realizing that these were the places where we were finding problem-solving tools who could help us move from this to that. And a group that has remained a close partner is the Institute of Healthcare Improvement. And they've brought um, improvement science um, into the healthcare field and, in fact, persuaded us that um, uh, getting to better outcomes on housing people might look more like a well-run Toyota factory than whatever the heck we were doing that was producing this. And so uh, IHI had led an effort called the 100,000 Lives Campaign to drive the adoption of life-saving practices that were really about behavior change on the part of people working in hospitals. It wasn't about we're going to save 100,000 lives because we're all going to buy expensive new equipment. But no, we're going to change the way we work. And so we had watched this and realized the power in setting a big collective goal to drive behavior change and to shift uh, people's uh, belief system that homelessness was all about the lack of affordable housing or people not wanting housing. And in fact, it was about broken systems. And so in July 2010, we launched the 100,000 Homes Campaign. And we had, um, at that point, I think, uh, gathered about 18 communities uh, who were just ready to you know, say, you know, it, the, the, the issue is the way we're working, not just you know, the, the, the availability of housing. And we set a goal of collectively housing 100,000 of the most chronic and vulnerable homeless across the country in four years, and basically set up this massive learning community. And it was interesting, we, you know, when you think about you know, the, 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 the holy grail being getting to scale, well, what we discovered is you know, harnessing teams and communities, training them, putting them together in a movement, you know, accelerating learning and the transfer of practice, uh, teaching new skills, that that's a powerful way to scale an idea as opposed to setting up offices in what ended up being 186 communities around the country. And um, to, uh, to fast forward, at the end of the four years, uh, communities had housed more than 105,000 long-term vulnerable homeless people, largely with the resources they already had. But by moving from that chaos to a, a more streamlined system. And what um, we also discovered was, uh, and had uh, the Urban Institute do an evaluation at the end, was that uh, key uh, characteristics um, uh, of uh, the most successful communities included having the most robust team. Uh, and so this is very, any kind of complex problem solving, as you know, is a team sport. And the team here in homelessness needed to consist of the local elected officials office, the not-for-profit consortium, the housing authority, and the VA. And to the extent that those groups were working together in a community, seeing success in the same way, sharing an aim, sharing data, and, and, and um, uh, using a triage system that would identify the most vulnerable and long-term homeless by name, they were able to mobilize community re resources that they had not even thought of. Like, for instance, we get in the habit of saying, this individual is homeless. Well, this individual is all, also possibly elderly or a veteran or someone with cancer or young. And that, you know, there are other resources in communities that, you know, track different uh, other dimensions of our identity. And once 
people are like, this is actually this human being with this name and this history and these, all of these other resources somehow, you know, like, oh, we'd never thought of this before as long as we had that person trapped in this homelessness identity. And so 100,000 homes, an amazing uh, uh, um, uh, success for all of the communities involved. But one thing it didn't do, while it had this um, powerful catalytic effect in showing communities that it was their own systems and their own processes that were flawed, it didn't actually get close to ending homelessness in any of these 186 communities. So we knew that um, there needed to be you know, a next chapter and a next until we actually figured that out. And so what we did um, in at the beginning, well, the fall of 2014 uh, to launch at the beginning of 2015 was we uh, put the word out to communities, including those who hadn't participated in 100,000 homes, that um, for those who are willing and would be prepared to assemble that team I described, your chief executive of the municipality or the county or the state in some cases, you could apply as a unit of government, um, the housing authority or authorities, the VA and the not-for-profit consortium, if you would apply housing first, the idea that you know it's housing and then whatever a person needs to you know, support their recovery, not you have to you know, um, uh, uh, achieve housing as a reward. So housing first had to be your, your um, uh, uh, practice across the board, uh, that you were willing to collect and share data, whatever data we collectively discovered we needed, uh, and share data, report it and share it with the rest of the team use a performance management or triage system so you could actually see where um, interventions were having an effect and have a, a feedback loop that all could learn from, and then participate uh, generously in a learning community. Well, we had 75 communities sign up, and the goal was to actually figure out what it was going to take to permanently end chronic and veteran homelessness. And so we are about 18 months into that, uh, the um, uh, basic disciplines, and I'd say we've learned something powerful every three months, but the basic disciplines are you go to the people. You know, that this is, again, who uh, designs the process and who designs the housing. This is not work that is happening behind desks. It's about linking what's happening with outreach teams, emergency room nurses, at jails, at shelters, uh, with you know, what a community's housing policy is around how housing gets allocated. So you know, I, I was describing back at the Times Square where you know, whoever applied first, well actually, you know, what we realized with these communities you need to do is you need to go out and know by name every person who's experiencing homelessness and persuade them to let you help them. It's a complete inversion. But you know, when you think of so many of um, the, uh, the, the, the um, important um, uh, uh, problems around that, that outlier group, people who never seem to get what they need in conventional systems, you know, what we have learned with communities is if you know people by name and go to them and work with them patiently, you can shift a whole system. We also, as I mentioned, discovered the power of the by name list, uh, not only for revealing other parts of a person's identity that could lead to helping them find housing, but um, we, um, uh, uh, in the first year of Built for Zero, used communities' existing data, which um, uh, HUD requires an annual point in time count. And so communities began the, the uh, Built for Zero journey thinking, this is the number of people I have to house. Well, in about a dozen of our 75 communities, they got to uh, December and uh, they'd housed all the numbers of people they were supposed to house and they still were nowhere near ending chronic and veteran homelessness. So the, um, the, the crisis and the, 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 the opening there was everyone's data was crappy, that it wasn't good enough, we weren't gonna solve a problem using HUD standards that we needed to basically start thinking about this uh, issue the way you would think about a pandemic. If you were going to stop Ebola, would you just hope to like generalize your, your, your initiatives? No, you'd have to know by name 
who you're talking about, where they are, uh, the state of their, um, uh, of, of their condition. And so communities were just like, you got to be kidding. We've got to find a way to collect by name real time data. And five communities dropped out at that point, but 70 went forward. And this is, is you know, basically the, the, you know, where, where communities uh, were in terms of going from something they thought was impossible in uh, January of 2016 to where we are now. And, you know, my, my colleagues were uh, 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 pleased to see that in the new guidance for HUD and the VA, by name lists are there as like, you need to be working toward a by name list. It's totally revolutionized the way communities are now thinking about homelessness as the key to actually making progress. So this is what it took to kind of get communities to this data standard they never you know, imagined they could reach. And uh, the data allows them to collect these five uh, points on their monthly dashboard. So communities actually know if they are making progress on the only thing that matters, or do you have fewer homeless people uh, this month than last month, and can you account for where people actually have been placed or gone off the radar screen? And so the quality of data is turning out to be a more powerful tool than many things that have been applied to this issue over the years, uh, including, you know, I think it's a question mark, you know, uh, many of the, 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 the different affordable housing problems, uh, uh, programs, and that that hasn't solved the problem without the specificity and the insight revealed by person-specific data. And this is where we are now, about 18 months into the campaign, and, and truly the fact that, you know, we're seeing this happening is, um, you know, it's breathtaking to me, and it's, it's these communities doing the work but we have seven of the 70 communities that have now sustainably ended veteran homelessness, and they know in real time anyone who's coming back into the system, and they have such tightly run housing systems that they can get people rehoused immediately. But what we're seeing, and to continue on this kind of public health uh, analogy, that we're seeing that you know treatment, prevention, surveillance, it has to be part of an interconnected system when it gets to housing. And uh, this, the, the fact that any new veteran who becomes homeless, you know, communities now have the ability to make that more and more rare, to understand what's happening upstream, and to rehouse people quickly. Now, with chronic homelessness, you age into that. A chronically homeless individual is someone who's been homeless continuously for a year and has a disability or has had several episodes over the course of two years. Uh, so that's a hard zero. We now have three communities uh, that uh, as of August have ended chronic homelessness, like they're done, you know, now they're marching down and anyone who's been homeless six months or more, they're housing them next. There are another two communities that uh, just last week got there, but we, we're, we always wait six months to see that they're actually holding it. But more than 75,000 people housed, many of whom were not even known by name at the beginning of uh, 2015. But what's also so powerful is now the expectation has shifted just because of a few vanguard communities. Now in this movement, there's no one saying can't be done. They're like, okay, what do we have to do? And uh, the, the, the onus is back on the team, the community, for actually organizing their work, their processes, their resources in ways that actually get that last mile accomplished for vulnerable people. So. I'm going to shift now to um, uh, the other part of this story because housing really does matter. It just has to be within the context of uh, an ecosystem that's actually connecting to people who cannot navigate the housing market on their own. And uh, um, so th this notion of um, what a community housing system could look like and who gets to design it well, what we've learned in now many communities where we've had an opportunity to speak to individuals who've been homeless for long periods of time, uh, and, and back to the original research among people living on the streets of Times Square, what we um, have come to see are maybe the missing pieces of the housing options um, uh, uh, part of the system are Housing that um, the people who need it, what I, if I could summarize it, say is uh, modest, 
it's accessible, it's well designed, and it has um, uh, the social supports uh, close at hand. And uh, when you contrast that with some of the things that you know, as designers we get excited about, which is you know, you know, new buildings and you know, lovely innovative design. What is striking to me, and which I can say with, with, with no equivocation, is that doesn't matter all that much to people who are fighting to get on the, the basic uh, first and second rung of the housing ladders. What matters, or what I, I mentioned earlier, is it safe, is it clean, is it private, can I afford it, can I live in it on my own terms? and uh, can, it, can it be uh, adjusted to fit my economic circumstances. And so we, um, starting uh, uh, back in our, our earlier organization at Common Ground, um, we began experimenting with different housing forms. And I would say what they had in common, and, and I, that they're also much needed in just about every high cost housing market where we're working now, are different uh, models that uh, create uh, different levels of privacy and affordability and that actually use existing housing more densely. And so I'll kind of take you on a bit of a learning journey because these types of housing options really are important in this you know, kind of well-organized um, housing system. And we hear over and over again in communities it's the, for want of this that, um, that people can't solve their housing needs on their own. Um, this project, uh, the Andrews, was one of the uh, last remaining Bowery lodging houses. And I remember when we were analyzing all of the data and we'd had you know, a number of um, uh, 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 design charrettes with individuals who are homeless to kind of uh, articulate and, and actually do some experimental building around what new housing forms could allow that privacy, uh, cleanliness, no question to asked, and, and uh, very deep affordability. Like, could we actually build something that could be rented for $10 a night? We started thinking that what uh, individuals were telling us and describing to us sounded a lot like a well-designed and well-run uh, cubicle hotel. Uh, that this type of housing had existed certainly on the Bowery in New York and in many cities you know, up through the 1950s, and then it was pretty systematically, you know, closed, replaced, and frankly, a lot of it, you know, deserved to be closed or replaced, but the basic need it was addressing never went away, just did not uh, been um, uh, offered in, in um, a decent form. So we um, ended up buying this Andrews Hotel, the, the one right there in the middle, see, if, um, which, uh, when we acquired it, was pretty creepy looking, had about 199 uh, uh, sort of encrusted cubicles, you know, like years and years of smoke and, you know, it was really just a world unto itself. And uh, there were, gosh, I think uh, almost 90 men who'd lived there anywhere from a few years to over 20 years still living there. And uh, we uh, added three floors to it, but before uh, we undertook to uh, renovate the interior of the building, we had a, a, a whole design competition that some people in this room participated in, and uh, 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 created uh, um, uh, an opportunity for five of the designs to be developed and implemented. Actually, only three of the teams decided to go forward. But um, it, it basically looks like housing by IKEA. But what, after you know, many kind of sort of hilarious meetings with the building department who had never seen the likes, we realized that you know the, they could consider uh, the units to be furniture as long as uh, it was um, designed so that you know there was uh, shared uh, light and air and ventilation. And so, in a building that had we renovated it to be uh, conventional housing. We would have been able to fit, I think, 34 units. We were able uh, to actually uh, uh, create, uh, I think, uh, 149. And uh, it, um, in, in some ways, I mean, from a design standpoint, the project was spectacular. And the original tenants participated in the design, Charette. It was really quite a, uh, you know, a, a fascinating process. But um, uh, it, it actually has never operated on a direct night-by-night -night pay basis. 
uh, the city of New York, uh, you know, kind of swooped in with an op operating contract that actually allowed, you know, solved the problem of how to pay for the social services. But I think in some ways this is yet an unrealized um, agenda item. Can we collectively among us build housing that people could actually rent, you know, for less than ten dollars a night, and uh, provide something that uh, actually cities always had, you know, but just isn't available anymore, this uh, very um, inexpensive, uh, 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 safe um, uh, housing. Another project that got at this question of how do we use existing housing in a more dense way to actually create more housing opportunities for more people and to go about it with the spirit of, you know, what people were asking for, which is, you know, simplicity, modesty, accessibility. We um, worked with the Actors Fund of America to take a building that had been in bankruptcy, um, a tower on the corner of 59th and 10th, and turn what had been built as uh, originally luxury housing but never opened into shared housing for uh, a total of 178 people. There were, I think, 90 apartments, so we were able to house that many more people by taking two, three, and four bedroom units and turning them into shared suites where individuals could have a lease to a half, a third, or a quarter of the unit as uh, 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 common space as well as their own bedroom. And interestingly, we combined, um, and, and you know, just think again about the scale of this project, the only prototypes we could find were like shared housing among elderly people in Vermont, you know, that, uh, you know, very homogeneous um, populations. But we combined uh, individuals living with HIV AIDS, the elderly and uh, the working poor, who had some tie to the um, performing arts uh, community. And it required really thinking about how you manage, how you mediate uh, kind of roommate arrangements. But uh, the, the, this project has been a huge success. You know, I think it's been like 22 years. But again, uh, really changed the way uh, the, the building was designed and operated internally and created um, almost twice as many housing opportunities for individuals than if they had been rented as individual family dwelling units. Um, this is um, an example of um, a, a building that Nadine and I worked on. Um, it's the rooftop garden of the Christopher, which started off as New York City's initial uh, YMCA residence. And um, I always like to point out that you know, this idea that single people without much money need different forms of housing that are modest, safe, accessible, this is like so not a new idea. Like the YMCA movement started in I think the mid 19th century. And it was the loss of these types of units that have compounded you know, the, the difficulties uh, people face in, in uh, uh, dealing with their first step housing needs. Uh, this particular building was converted um, into uh, 40 uh, shared units for young people aging out of foster care or who are already homeless in shared suites and another 107 uh, small efficiency apartments. But um, what's, what's, you know, I think the, the notable thing to take away is even though this lovely roof garden, modesty, simplicity, and just, you know, uh, affordability, just, again, responsive to the user. And um, I also wanted to show these um, uh, two other slides, which I think begin to um, uh, uh, lead us to what are some interesting, you know, uh, answers to these questions of, you know, how do we create more options within uh, a well-ordered and um, uh, well-managed and connected housing system? This is actually a project in Helsinki. Uh, uh, the Y Foundation, which is a group that we've uh, collaborated with a bit. Um, Finland is the only country in Europe that is steadily reducing homelessness. And their um, uh, realization was that they needed to take all of the buildings that they were using as shelter and temporary housing and just turn them into permanent affordable housing for the people who were otherwise in this kind of institutional state. 
So they undertook a program of renovating buildings that had been used in a congregate fashion, and they have seen this precipitous drop in homelessness. In fact, their executive director has an interesting theory that um, shelters help to create homelessness. It actually, you know, is distorting of the housing market, and that, um, you know, the, the, that we need to get to a place, and again, it sounds like lessons we can learn from the healthcare system, where you're doing everything you can to keep people out of an emergency room, or to quickly return them to their home, and that you know you you really want to shrink your institutional infrastructure, and so there are about 8,000 I think uh, former shelter beds in buildings like these institutional ones that have now been turned into housing, and again, you know, modest, you know, affordable, uh, well managed. Um, and um, this is the type of uh, uh, housing that is, is um, you know, being looked to, especially in Europe, as a, a, a kind of a, a bit of a beacon for what uh, other European countries can do. And then I just thought that this is actually a pretty interesting thing for us to ponder, that um, this question that you know, Nadine and I worked on for so long, that how do we create something like the Andrews Hotel, something, um, you know, modest, uh, private, uh, inexpensive, kind of operate and, and pay on your own terms, that this has moved into the market now, you know, that uh, people on Wall Street can live at, uh, we live and, you know, pay more than certainly the, the people that we had in mind in designing, but that these actually are design problems. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, I saw some of their slides, I'm like, it looks like some of the images we had, you know, and we had our competition for the Andrews, but uh, that as designers, um, there's this really interesting convergence happening, I think, is what we've seen, what um, uh, the, you know, modest, private, affordable, you know, housing on your own terms options that homeless people have been telling us about for years, you know, now, you know, people on Wall Street are seeking them too. Well, in closing, I just want to give you a bit of a sense of where we think the future can, can move here in uh, communities that uh, are really grappling with this issue of uh, building accountable, uh, uh, trackable, uh, data-driven uh, housing systems that don't lose track of people, that know by name the people who need support, that has a triage system in place so that people who need just a slight bit of assistance get that quickly, but those who need permanent supportive housing or longer-term subsidies that they're identified and moved in that direction. Well, this is a, a project that we opened last year, this uh, striking uh, uh, new construction um, uh, called the Conway Residence, which is uh, on North Capitol in Washington, D.C. And what's interesting here, and it's a beautiful building, it's uh, 124 units, half of the units are for veterans exiting homelessness in uh, Washington, D.C., and the other half also with a veteran's preference um, uh, for uh, uh, individuals who are lower income working people, and then about 17 of the units are uh, set aside within that group for individuals who have um, a history of uh, mental health issues and receive help from the district mental health agencies. And so uh, what's interesting and so future-oriented about this building is um, we've also been working with the District of Columbia as part of 100,000 Homes and Built for Zero. They were one of the first large communities to get to a by-name list. And so by the time we were planning the last phase of Conway, um, it, it was you know long development cycle, but by the time we were getting ready to rent it up, we knew that the um, 60, actually it ended up being about 70, um, homeless veterans who were moving in were the first 70 on the by name list of the city's homeless veterans who were the most fragile and needed to be moved into housing most urgently. And so for us it really has signaled this new um, kind of convergence of the housing work and the, the different models that, that we've been developing over the years and the fact that we're going to solve this problem and actually meet the housing needs of our most vulnerable citizens if we act with that kind of intentionality, that we design our housing to fit the people and to fit specific people whose names we know and by housing them, we can actually get to a state 
where all of us have that basic, modest, simple, safe, affordable place to live. Thank you. Give a minute for thank you so much um, for that talk and there are so many um, threads that I want to follow up on um, and and I know you know right now um, even within this room you'll you'll have students from real estate development from architecture from planning from urban design and and so much of your talk um, I think also presents a, a direct challenge to pedagogy and how we teach <laughs> so you know, I was, I was wondering if you could take a minute to reflect on, um, to just to, to add a finer point to that, just the concept of housing as a verb, right? It's not necessarily, um, uh, it's not necessarily a, a, a concept that is, is specific to specific silos, right? It's not necessarily simply a problem of architecture. Um, it's in, you know, your sort of, reinvention of this subject is, is truly cross-cutting, um, looking at not only, you know, looking at the, this problem from the experience of the individual and, and it's sort of starting which, with, with something I so transformational is simply asking the right questions and trying to, to, to understand um, these issues through people's lives. Um, and, and so I guess my, my question is, looking introspectively, right, because your entire lecture in some degree is almost like a challenge for a school of architecture to work differently, to not just think about, you know, uh, the, these kinds of issues as siloed re relative to architecture or urbanism or public health. Um, you know, are, do you have um, thoughts or reflections on your, your experience in the real estate program here or... Um, thoughts about how we might also kind of change how we're teaching our students or engaging in the world relative to some of these issues that you're facing uh, and that you see across the, the nation? Ideas about how we might teach and learn differently relative to what you see? Well, the easy part of that question is uh, I remember um, a, a couple of really key experiences when I was here at Columbia. One was uh, taking a few classes from Gwen Wright and just thinking mm -hmm. about, frankly, the people who use housing, you know, and, and uh, her, um, and, and just the whole social uh, construct of why certain housing forms evolved. And so that actually was very influential in mm -hmm. my, I think, looking at that Times Square Hotel and seeing, yeah, you know, this, I could, I could imagine, you know, uh, how design and a different approach to that building could actually create a different um, environment that was a solution to mm -hmm. the housing needs of some. And then the other, I just appreciated, um, I think at the time I was working, at uh, Brooklyn Catholic Charities and these, working on these kind of small, almost impossible projects with, you know, like at the end of the day, maybe 20 units would be built. And I'm like, everyone else in the, the, the program with me had, you know, very large ambitions as mm -hmm, far as mm -hmm. what they'd be building. I'm like, I gotta step it up. Gotta scale yeah, it up, so, right, yeah. right. <laughs> so, but um, as far as how uh, teaching um, should shift. Mm -hmm. And I don't think this is just about, you know, the kind of the social challenge that I very frankly put to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think that uh, we all need to have a different set of tools in our toolkit to just manage the issues that we're facing in mm -hmm. this century. Um, we have found that in our own organization, and we're, we're playing catch up, um, but that there are four critical skills that that you, you kind of need to actually be able to move some of these complex problems forward. One is a basic facility with data and, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, actually sort of the, the idea that data is such a powerful tool in any work, mm -hmm. you know, I, 
don't need to go further, but it's hugely uh, important that you, know, you understand how to recognize large patterns and use data for problem solving, not judgment. And I think mm -hmm. that's the big shift. You know, not whether you did well or didn't based Assessment, on your score, right. mm -hmm. you know, but, or for compliance purposes, but mm -hmm. like, are things going in mm -hmm. an interesting, good, desired, expected direction or not? Mm -hmm. And uh, while um, you know, I think that there's this interesting insight that you know, we've uh, had, which is you, know, you need some of the uh, access to uh, large data sets to see patterns, but you need very granular data to solve problems. Very so, and then the other uh, skill is um, design thinking. Mm -hmm. That um, you know, it's the the idea that you're never stuck; that you just need to form a new hypothesis and test it mm -hmm. and iterate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then coupling that with uh, uh, with quality improvement training, I mean, that's really, you know, I think been the revolutionary piece of our, our work in these movements that, you know, go to our learning collaboratives and everyone's there with their run charts, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so different from the way I think we've been trained to think about um, how to solve complex problems. And then uh, being able to uh, facilitate meetings of different interest groups respectfully and effectively and purposefully. So the, you know, like the data, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the quality improvement, the design thinking, the facilitation, I think whatever, whether it's climate issues yep. or political division, yeah. mm -hmm. it's kind of like, how do you, how do you move things Convene. forward? Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. so I totally agree. So I'm taking copious notes because <laughs> this are, I mean, this is literally how we're, we're trying to, mm -hmm. I think, position our, our students to not just think in terms of, um, I'm an architect, I am a, but, but to try to bring this sort of design thinking and, and kind mm -hmm. of creative process to, to these multi-sector mm -hmm. challenges. I had another question and I'd love to open it up to, to the group here who are probably anxious to get some questions in about not just the role of the building scale, but the role of literally the urbanism mm -hmm. of the sort of contexts in which you work. Um, I'm particularly struck by, you talk about storytelling, about the stories of, of um, how um, some of the homelessness, to put the big, the non-granular level on it, but um, is also exacerbated by sort of distance or lack of opportunity and, and you know, many um, challenges, for example, in New York, or as you, you mentioned, that there's out in the boroughs or like there's in the rockaways or it's these kind of places that are far and far from access to transportation, access to, you know, schools within a walkable distance, access to um, parks or open space or other kind of urban um, amenities that really help to weave people into the fabric mm -hmm. of, uh, of a community and that, mm -hmm. you know, your, your phrasing of community solutions is, I think, so critical. Um, and so I guess I'm very curious as to, you know, how you see the role of the city playing out in some of these issues, whether it's, you know, the transport, you know, because I, I find that the, 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 the challenge of being a, a, um, a homeless family in New York City <laughs> is very different um, from being someone, say, in Phoenix, Arizona, where you have a two-hour commute on a bus, or there are these kind of interrelated, nested challenges of school, job, um, et cetera, kind of become tied up into literally a physical urban landscape that is somehow distance. Have you kind of done any thought, you know, thought on some of those issues relative to transport or other urban, urban forms. Yeah. Well, yeah, some maybe disconnected thoughts on mm -hmm. that, but um, we work now, additional communities have joined uh, Built for Zero, so we work, I think, in three entire states, uh, pretty big ones, um, mm -hmm. New Mexico, Utah, and West Virginia, and most of Virginia. And so, mm -hmm. you know, they've got some pretty serious, you know, geography. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, it go, just goes to this question of mm -hmm. you need to go to the people who are they you know, are. trapped mm -hmm. in homelessness mm -hmm. rather than, you know, the way the system has always worked, well, we're here and these are our hours and mm -hmm. you come with your referral. 
Um, it's also meant that you need a much bigger team. You need to basically enlist the sheriff, the emergency room nurse, the you know the fire department, people whose daily job is not thinking about homelessness, but the community's infrastructure, you know, the, the, the public you know, sector workforce. And that the way in which we're seeing this issue get solved, I think, has much to um, offer other complex problems. We've got, mm. Interestingly, we've gotten just a number of calls, um, maybe because of some of the places we're working, about could we imagine adapting this methodology to the opioid crisis? And the idea mm -hmm. is um, you need, even in dispersed geographies, mm -hmm. um, these can't be understood as, and as much as I'm saying, you know, you need to know each individual. They cannot be understood as the problems of indi individuals. Yeah. It's it, they are, you know, reflecting a broken community system, mm -hmm. and so the model that we um, really sort of emphasize with the communities in which we're working is a virtual command center. Just imagine. You know, it's a hurricane, or again, you know, you're you're setting up the the, the local effort when there's an outbreak of a, um, an infectious disease. You need to have, either in reality or virtually, information that's you know all in the same place, clear accountability, and a community level kind of mindset. Not like my program mm -hmm. only does this right over there. Just like yeah. we're all in, you know, mm -hmm. in this situation. And if that can be constructed, even in kind of very dispersed places like New Mexico, right. I think they may be the first state to end chronic and veteran homelessness. And again, very poor, mm -hmm. you know, and very tough. Just Mississippi do. is doing it. Go figure. These are places without a lot of resources. You know, it's basically what the federal government sends. Mm -hmm. But there's almost, I've seen an inverse relationship between a lot of money flowing into a system and the resourcefulness <laughs> and, you know, kind of the... the uh, essential innovation that emerges, like, how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to have to make the sheriff the outreach worker. Hmm. Yeah, so that's really exciting. All right, so I'd like to open it up for some questions from our larger audience. Um, we have some urban design and real estate students here. There's, there's one in the middle. Sorry. If you could say your name um, oh, I'm, and speak. I'm uh, Thanks. James Thanks. Russell, and uh, Thanks, James. I've been doing some work on homelessness uh, with the city. Mm -hmm. And the city's struggling with, um, you know, something like 66,000 people a night homeless mm -hmm. and saying, we, we can't do what you do with the housing first model. We can only do, we have to do shelters while we try and figure out how we're going to find those 66,000 units that people need. Of course, two-thirds of these are also families, which is even more horrific to think about. Um, when we're talking about this kind of scale, and we're also seeing these huge increases in a lot of, as you noted, the expensive cities, you know, uh, um, are they, is Housing First really realistic? You know, housing First means, you know, just that, but it doesn't mean the same thing for everyone. For instance, you know, I go back to this uh, insight that has been so powerful for us in the communities that are making progress, which is homelessness is too big a category. You know, some people really need to be diverted from the front door of the shelter, and the attitude of the shelter system has to be, how do we do whatever we can to help you solve your housing crisis without you know, processing you into this institution? We see, you know, examples in many parts of the country where that's where they're placing their emphasis. And so they're focused on housing first. How do we get you to not lose your housing? How do we get you back into a situation that maybe is slipping away? But, you know, the, the issue is on how do we, you know, solve your housing problem as opposed to do you or don't you qualify for shelter? I think as long as that mindset governs the New York City system, you know, there's just very little progress to be made. Any follow-up? <laughs> okay. We have another question up here. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, so um, uh, you were talking about like housing community systems. 
And I was wondering if, like, with people from different backgrounds living together, I was wondering if you had, like, um, have seen, like, patterns of healthy communities. And uh, what would you, uh, how would you define a healthy community and, mm. like, health and community? Well, I think, you know, we, we learned early to th think of our big buildings as small towns and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, who's in charge? Are the services good? You know, are people, you know, um, you know, uh, 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 paying attention to you and kind of knowing you by name, yeah, that like a na I, neighborhood, yeah, yeah, like a you know twelve story neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But uh, the um, the question of a a healthy neighborhood is it's both subjective or healthy town. Um, but I'd say in the two neighborhood projects that we are working on to try to get upstream of homelessness, yeah, the the. The, the, the vision that's shared by all of our partners and the residents we work with is uh, making these neighborhoods um, uh, safe, healthy, and prosperous. And the measures that we're using really go to what community members say they most value, like how many people are getting into jobs, uh, in, in the case in, uh, in Brownsville and in the north end of Hartford, uh, looking at uh, 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 population health issues. Uh, the, the focus of our, uh, the next phase of our work there is asthma. I think it's also fascinating, you know, your, your point earlier in the, the talk about um, just healthcare in general, like when you begin to not mm -hmm. only look from the eyes of the individual and listen to stories and kind of, but, but also taking these models from, you know, other <laughs> Um, that have addressed other challenges and kind of overlaying them and looking at where these synergies are is particularly fascinating. I feel like there's also been, you know, there's, I, I feel like somehow a, the public health model vis-a-vis -vis architecture is also quite fascinating yeah. and opens up all sorts of new, new territories for us to, as practitioners, I think, mm -hmm. rather than just saying, oh, we're responding to an existing brief or a crisis and mm -hmm. with, rather as a doctor would treat a patient in ER, mm -hmm. there's these broader systemic mm -hmm. issues to be, to be investigated through research and through mm -hmm. combining kind of design, innovation, and mm -hmm. action um, that are just also, mm -hmm. I think, opens opens up so many doors in that in that response. Mm -hmm. um, let's have one more, one or a couple more questions here. There's one. Oh, sorry. There's one over here. Okay. Hi. Um, so the one of the biggest issues right now with affordable housing is the expense to maintain the buildings. So when you're thinking about how to make your projects sustainable long-term, how does your team tackle that? Thus far, and yeah, I can answer in a couple ways, when we've actually built a building, you know, we have uh, typically baked into it a financial model where um, there's very little or no debt um, and so that there's capacity for the ongoing maintenance, and that's actually you know, by design. In cases where um, the, uh, say, in, in many of the communities that are part of Built for Zero, they're using just uh, existing housing and coupling that available apartment with um, a, a rental subsidy voucher of some type, and it's the obligation of the property owner to maintain the housing and. Um, Thus far, working with chronically homeless and homeless veterans, um, you know, lots of communities have run out of vouchers, but they're negotiating with landlords to um, uh, uh, work at lower rates. It's interesting when you see communities who are kind of fi uh, figuring this out. They've involved the private landlord community. Um, your one one project we're working on now is is maybe an interesting one to be. Uh, mindful of because we're experimenting with what are some housing models that fit that you know simple, modest, clean, affordable um, uh, uh, template, and this is uh, in Denver, and uh, we would we've got an offer in on an existing building that needs probably about twenty thousand uh, dollars per unit and improvements, but um, the we think we can essentially finance it with social impact capital and commercial debt because uh, the residents will have vouchers from the VA. 
So we do have to model the maintenance costs a little differently, but um, it does appear in that market that you know this model works. So you have to be mindful of it. Kind of you can get to a different answer depending on the specific conditions. Hmm. Sorry, question here, and then there's one behind you too. Hi, um, my name is Daisy, and I'm teaching housing um, here at Columbia. I was wondering. Um, it's really, I loved your lecture, by the way, and it was really helpful to hear um, at least housing talked about um, uh, differently. Mm -hmm. um, and one way that it's different is it takes um, development out of the equation in a, a traditional sense, right? So, and it leaves an elephant in the room about how um, housing, how you handle housing um, in relation to how it's funded. So I think my question is, Really, like, how are you managing conversations between developers, the government? How are housing, um, your particular housing, getting funded? Mm. How does it all happen? How does it all happen? <laughs> we look at that, the you know, the yeah. sort of ecosystem of. <laughs> so how are how are these projects funded? Right. Yeah. It sounds like you were getting a little bit into that in the last response. Sure, yeah. I can I can give you um, maybe two models, but the thing is. There should be a, a model, and there isn't yet yeah. really. Uh, you know, the the Conway building that I showed at the end. I think we had like forty seven different entities that contributed. You know, I think fifteen that actually had very significant sums in the project. And you can look at that as what great leverage, or you can also say this is insanity. You know, it took <laughs> years to put all that together. And so I think if we want to get serious about having housing systems that work, we have to actually pool our capital and make it a whole lot easier to get money into deals and, ra and not at the deal level be figuring out this kind of crazy puzzle. Um, I guess the good news is, yeah, we put it all together, but it, you know, like if we're going to recognize this as an urgent issue, we've really got to change the model a bit, which is why flipping to the, um, the Denver project, our colleague who heads our real estate team is really interested in, you know, given where interest rates are, and there being a lot of social impact capital out there, or a lot of investors thinking they'd like to get some sort of safe but um, socially beneficial Meaningful. return. Mm, yeah. Like, there is more of it. I'm, at least I've been told by a number <laughs> of these investor and family office groups that there is more of it than there are deals uh, that look like they're going to be comprehensible and, and solid. So we think that there could be some real opportunity there. You know, it's not going to solve for every situation, but in this particular case, we're you know buying existing substandard uh, properties, improving them, making them more sustainable, and targeting them as we do to the people who are the most vulnerable. We think that this will be an interesting thing to experiment with and yeah, possibly transferable. Mm. Great to hear. I think there was another question here. Can you pass the mic? Hi, thanks for the lecture. I had, uh, well, it's sort of two maybe interrelated questions. Um, one, uh, I just moved from Los Angeles, so there's been, as I'm sure you know, an enormous amount of uh, money is going to come into the system through mm -hmm. public referenda, but there's also remains mm -hmm. an enormous amount of uh, resistance at the local level to actually pr producing uh, housing from community opposition to the projects themselves. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you reconcile those um, two forces in your work between maybe having the opportunities at a sort of, um, say, a state level to have the resources to do the project, but not at a local level to find the opportunity to actually realize it. Um, and then the second question would be, uh, in the context of, of the architecture school, where you see opportunities for architecture students or, or uh, faculty, as it were, um, to become involved in the process, or maybe to use your term, sort of go upstream, and rather than waiting for a project or waiting for an RFQ or an RFP mm -hmm. that you might um, uh, be involved in pursuing, but actually to move into uh, the development of these projects or pursue um, housing alternatives at a, at a kind of structural level as opposed to simply waiting for projects to drop down to the level of, uh, you know, a client coming to you or you finding a client? Mm -hmm. uh, I think 
I mean, it, I don't think there's a, a single answer to the question you posed about Los Angeles and um, you know, local resistance and NIMBYism. I mean, I, I, I do feel that the future has got to involve just having fewer different housing types and just integrating units within whatever housing we're building that are more accessible to individuals with you know, different you know, backgrounds or, or medical and social challenges. I think it's the standalone projects that are um, yeah, kind of a, a bit of the, the flashpoints for uh, uh, NIMBYism. Um, you know, we, we've never lost a project to NIMBYism, but we have spent years working our way to you know, the buy-in, and sometimes it's um, waiting for uh, you know, a particularly disruptive person to leave the stage. Um, but um, I, I, I do th see in a number of the communities that have been part of 100,000 homes and built for zero, the, um, once you have a sense of your community being organized and knowing, you know, knowing what its aims are and having that data, it's been interesting to see in a couple of places um, you know, local leaders make the case for this is why we need this new housing because you know we have this remaining number of veterans. Um, it's um, a building strategy alone isn't going to be sufficient to solve this problem. Is maybe the note I'd like to end on. Um, you know, the um, it 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 goes to I think the question that Kate raised earlier. This is a this problem of like, broken housing systems is the problem that needs to be at the front, not homelessness. Homelessness is an indicator of that problem. And as long as we're thinking, well, this is a project for the homeless, and not speaking in terms of the larger system breakdown, I think we end up having the wrong conversation in our development kind of uh, um, uh, uh, meetings. But as far as... Uh, Students, I mean, I've been excited to learn more just being here this evening about the Hudson Valley Lab and mm -hmm. you know the 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 work that uh, you know teams here are doing in communities that are struggling that don't probably have even the infrastructure to do the research on where the funding opportunities are, what the right planning guidelines should be to enable you know the 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 kind of development that would actually help move them toward having a housing system rather than random activity. So I think this community type work is, is, is you know, an incredibly exciting place to uh, focus you know, your, um, your pro bono time or, or your, your uh, study time. The, um, I, there's a lot of work to be done, though, and we're beginning to, in Chicago, do some interesting things because they are now, their data is so good on veteran homelessness that um, we can, with them and you know, student volunteers, do quanti qualitative interviews of veterans who are coming into their system to know what's happening to them before they come in. And already we found that it's like one VA hospital that needs to be retrained. You know, like that lots of these veterans have had contact with the VA and their staff has just said, well, nothing here for you. And so um, that's a place where students are making a real difference in helping a community understand the dynamics of its housing system. Great, I think we have time for a last question, or two more, or one more question. Okay, good, Christoph. No, I just, um, I'm, I'm here with, with um, like the incoming architecture um, class group. So what, we, what we're working on for the first four weeks of the semester is it's kind of like blurring the boundaries of a quarter of a city, turning actually an inside corner into an outside condition. So it, it kind of like, Pedagogically, very much looks at something that doesn't recognize or self-identify itself mm -hmm. as, as a kind of like piece of architecture or, or urbanism or something that sits in between um, development or, or the making of that kind of publicity. What we were talking about today in, in, in core, and this is why I think like we were all super excited to hear your talk, uh, um, being also so focused on, on design and, and architecture uh, for the particular reason, was something along the line of like, architecture and politics, meaning like if mm -hmm. 
we like so refreshingly look at what's available at hand and we are in our case looking at 14th street that kind of corridor that's like um, um, quite also prominent with with a lot of like HDFCs and HPT um, buildings. How do you deal in, in even within common grounds and it's just because it came up today with things like um, political shifts um, like for example um, and I love when you point at self-management and looking at maintenance models and so on and so forth. HDFCs to a certain degree were somewhat interesting and mm -hmm. successful in, in, in that regard. It almost sounds like that common ground kind of like pushes it to the next level of like uh, taking politics out, but at the same time, you 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 mm -hmm. gotta be able to work with regulations and policies and 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 and, and, and things of that sort, particularly with um, I've been looking at at a lot of like HDFC community board meetings mm -hmm. these days. They're like so under attack, like also based on on like the political shift and like different mayors coming in. How do you deal with it within? common ground where you focus on all the right things and all the things that get like us as architects excited, but mm -hmm. you are bound to policies as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure. I, I haven't been at common ground for a number of years, so I don't know how they're navigating any new politics. Um, but what we um, always sort of relied on was just a very strong on-site management team. And that in, and this goes to the NIMBY question too, when we'd be entering a new neighborhood, we would talk about our management systems, you know, our staffing, you know, how we would handle problems. Uh, and that was kind of the, the pact with both tenants and neighbors. And so, you know, just that attentive management, we always saw as core to, you know, what we were offering residents and the communities our buildings were in. And it's interesting, um, you know, management is so not sexy, but it really <laughs> is what it all comes down Where to. Where it's at. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, uh, when you think of all of the, you know, failed housing models, I'd say they're design and management failures. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's actually, it's been interesting you know, with um, our Washington DC building, we have um, a, a management company that's work, that works nationally. I think they have 35,000 units, but they're having to learn how to manage that kind of building where like the VA has case managers and like the goal is no one ever gets evicted here. It's our job to see that every tenant is successful. That's a shift, but people can learn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess we'll we'll take some more questions up on the on the fourth floor at a little reception. But I I just have the pleasure of thanking you for for spending your time here with us at GSAP. And I mean your lecture is so inspiring, and and it is not only kind of a window into how you think in terms of these sort of holistic approach and sort of very personal narrative driven approach to some of these issues. It's really you know sparked a lot of I think. Um, ideas about how we can kind of shift how we think, how we learn, and, and really kind of a chart a roadmap for, for how real estate, urban design, architecture, how we can all begin to sort of work together and work differently um, relative to these incredibly challenging issues of the future. So thank you so much for showing us that thought process. Yeah, thank you.